E3, one cannot have educational excellence without equity. The challenge the U.S. faces today is that the vast majority of our students are not excellently prepared for the workforce. From educators like Linda Darley Hammond to Geneva Gay, from authors like Tony Wagner to Thomas Friedman, and from corporations like Oracle to HP, they all agree, we need to redefine educational excellence. Another way to say this is, what does it really mean to be smart? Traditionally, being smart means how much you know. To use a sports analogy of American football, the end zone would be equivalent to high school graduation. Students are working their way down the field trying to learn as much content as possible. When they've learned enough, they graduate, and we call this being smart. There are two problems with this traditional way of winning. First, in this country, we have an educational achievement gap to start with. Based on race, class, gender, immigration status, etc., students are starting on different parts of the playing field. For example, low-income students do not have access to a private SAT tutor, or immigrant students must first learn to master the English language before they learn the content. But even if the U.S. could close the gap, we don't have the population compared to China or India to compete in this game. As many of you heard, they have more honor students than we have students, so we're never going to win. The second problem is that being smart is no longer just content knowledge, or in other words, just knowing stuff. The traditional educational approach has been like a drip system of knowledge that goes into a student who can later spew out answers on a standardized test. Like a tsunami, there is an overwhelming amount of information. We need a new game in the 21st century, for being smart is no longer how much you know, but how to navigate what is known. As a result of these two problems, we clearly have an educational crisis, because the rising tide of water is not affecting some of us, but rapidly drowning all of us. Our educational crisis is like a rising tide of water that is not affecting some of us, but rapidly drowning all of us. Traditionally, in crisis, the medical field has a proven response system that helps to identify what needs exist. This system used by ERs across the world, the Army and the Red Cross, categorizes people based on their needs. These categories are tagged as green, stable, but they still need attention in order to prevent future complications. Or yellow, they need observation and some medical attention. And red, urgent care is needed or the patient will die. We need to transfer this proven approach to education. And to help us understand what this would look like, we're going to follow a group of students, one of which is named Kelly. So as Kelly enters high school, the reality is only 75% will graduate high school. And this is 60% for African Americans and Latinos. The students who do not move forward are what we call in-risk. They'll represent the red category. Of these in-risk students, half of them stated they did not see school as relevant to their lives or that the classes were engaging. Now, of the remaining students, only 35% will be college ready and be eligible to attend a four-year university. This is only true for 25% of African Americans and Latinos. The students who are not college bound are what we call at risk because they are living in an exposed or potential at risk environment. These students make up the yellow category. The remaining students who quote, made it, still have another hurdle to overcome. These students are at risk in the future and make up what we call the green category. The reason that these students are at risk in the future is because only 60% will graduate college within six years. What many people don't know is that according to Fortune 500 companies, less than 25% of college graduates are excellently prepared to enter the workforce. So with only 5% of all our students in the educational system excellently prepared for the workforce, basically all of our students are in some form of risk. So no matter what color Kelly is, Kelly is either not engaged, not prepared, or playing the wrong game. So the question becomes, what should we be teaching students? 
So really, all students in the United States are at risk. As a result of globalization and advances in technology, one's value is no longer based solely on what you know. Like a tsunami, there's an overwhelming amount of information that is now stored in words that weren't around 20 years ago, like Google, YouTube, iPhone, apps, etc. People have more access on an individual cell phone with more knowledge than Encyclopedia Britannica. Unfortunately, our schools are set up and continue to measure success primarily through content knowledge. See Ken Robinson's video, Changing Educational Paradigms. Every country on earth at the moment is reforming public education. The students who are successful in this system have the privilege, opportunity, and support to absorb content in a conducive environment. And remember, this is only 5% of all students. Ironically, the students like Kelly who are being deemed unsuccessful by schools are often unsuccessful because they are busy navigating the systems required for their survival. Kelly, who not only has to function at school, also has the added challenge of navigating through these lived experiences. So I can't tell you the race, class, or gender of Kelly, but I know that there are millions of Kellys who have challenging experiences to go through and haven't acknowledged that they have skills that they've gained from it. So this could be Kelly being responsible for younger siblings before and after school, while parents, if there are even two, are still working. Or having to catch two buses just to get to school on time and in the afternoon, safely navigating two gang territories. Maybe Kelly has to translate at home from English to Spanish, but then also code switch from speaking standard English in the classroom to speaking Ebonics on the street. Or Kelly shares a bedroom with siblings and aunts and uncles. Or is just playing soccer, basketball, and football. But in addition, Kelly must figure out how to help to pay the family bills. And in all of this, Kelly is trying as a teenager to develop an identity that fits in all the circles that Kelly lives in. And in order to survive the navigation of this kind of environment, Kelly must have what we call cultural resiliency. And you know, the interesting thing that we found is that many of the students being deemed unsuccessful exhibit competencies that can be translated directly into 21st century skills, such as critical analysis, adaptability, cross-cultural communication, collaboration and innovation. Now remember, these were the skills businesses were looking for in the future employees and ones that were required to be considered excellently prepared for the workforce. So the question becomes, how can we translate the strengths from students' lived experiences into a new definition of educational excellence that values all student competencies and encompasses the 21st century skills required to navigate a new world and a new way of thinking? So when the world asks who is excellently prepared, all the Kellys who learn the content knowledge and learn how to acknowledge the skills they obtain from their lived experiences can respond, I am. I am innovative, I can adapt and collaborate, I have cross-cultural communication and critical thinking skills, and I am Kelly.